as we continue our series called Life and Peace, a verse out of Romans 8, 6 that says, uh, the mind set on the flesh, things of the world, is death. But the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. And so we've really been talking about how the mind works, how the mind affects who we are, and what our mind uh, is uh, meditating on and thinking about. The first thing we said is you either have the Holy Spirit or you don't. And this is talking about how those of us who have received the Spirit of Christ Jesus can have the mind of Christ, which is the new way in which we are intended to live. Um, so the first question we were asking is, do I know for sure that the Holy Spirit of God lives in me? And this is about surrendering your life and your rights to yourself and uh, making Jesus the Lord of your life. And then the second thing um, is that you were designed to live with this spiritual mind. And so it's not about a highlight reel of... Uh, you know, yeah, I know the Holy Spirit speaks to me. I remember 10 years ago or when I first got saved or something like this. this is really about a lifestyle of um, listening and keeping in step with the Holy Spirit. This week, uh, we're in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7. And the scripture says, For as the man thinks in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, he says to you. But his heart is not with you. So most of the time they just quote the first part as a man thinks so is he. But the context is eat and drink. But in his heart he's not with you. The amplified version says it this way. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. In behavior, one who manipulates. He says to you, eat and drink. Yet his heart is not with you. But it is begrudging the cost. So what it's really talking about is a man outside looks one way by what he does and how he looks and how he appears and even what he says with his mouth, but in his heart, that's how he really, really thinks. Okay, and this is, this is significant because our culture says um, you are what you do, but what Scripture teaches is that God looks upon the heart. All right, so you, the first thing, as a man thinks in heart, the first thing, your, your walk may match your talk, but does it match your heart? And this is significant for us to understand that the power of our heart um, is far more uh, complicated to not only our thinking, and I'm talking about your, your heart, um, your physiology, and your mind are affected by the heart rate variance, by the signals that your heart sends to your brain. It's very interesting. Um, one of my buddies, he's a physician, and he sent me an article. Recently, his mom passed away. She was in an elderly uh, care center, and she had this little puppy. And uh, when the puppy died, the next day she died, and the the doctor um, told my friend, who is also a doctor, that there's a thing called broken heart disease. And then he sent me an article that during COVID, uh, this diagnosis is happening at four times the rate which it has historically been diagnosed. That people are actually dying from a broken heart where their heart does not have plaque, it does not have arteriosclerosis. It does not have any other abnormality other than a significant stress, emotional stress event. And so um, this passage of scripture, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You can walk the walk. You can talk the talk. You can look righteous. You can do all the right things. But if your heart is begrudging, if your heart is miserly, if your heart is angry, that's what God is looking at. So it's the outside versus the inside. And scripture says this everywhere. Um, he's talking about hypocrites. Jesus talks about the hypocrites, you Pharisees. Um, you know, you judge the outside of the cup, making sure it's clean and pure. But the inside of the cup is dirty. 
So Jesus is saying, look, I, I see what you look like on the outside, but it's what's going on on the inside. Whereas our world says, if you walk the walk and talk the talk, then that's what matters. And God is saying, I look upon the heart. So the, the word integrity means whole, right? Undivided. And so a person that has integrity is, is on the outside, the exact same way they are on the inside. And on the inside, the exact same way they are on the outside. But in our culture, we look and if we see someone's words are this way and they do all the right things, then man, that must be a high integrity person. But we don't know what's going on inside. And sometimes neither do they. So um, think about this on a scale of one to 10. Do your outward words and actions line up with your heart? And I go to church, I serve in the nursery, um, and so that's like an eight. But inside, um, I'm far from God, I'm not passionate about Him, um, I rarely pursue Him, and so in my heart, affections toward God is like a three the world looking is going you're an eight but you know deep down in your heart you're a three is there this variance so where would you where would you place yourself in your heart and then what step would you need to take to go from a three to a four or a four to a five or an eight to a nine what is it that God uh, is speaking to you that you're holding back from him Isaiah 29, 13 says it this way. The Lord says, These people come near to me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they have been taught. It's not of their heart. It's not of their passion. They're just going through the most. And they show up on Sunday morning. They go to church. They click on the Zoom. I got to get my, got to get my church in. Um, so I can say I went to church. I always feel better after I watch the Zoom or watch the Facebook post, watch the church online. Um, he says, they come to me with their mouth and they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are for, far from me. God is interested in the heart. And here's why. So this heart or desire, um, your amygdala is the older like a, it's like a almond sized part of your brain and um, it's where emotions come from and the amygdala fires off based on historic things in the past and based on uh, previous experiences and um, the rational part of your brain the prefrontal cortex um, that's where logic comes in but logic does not make the decisions. Most of the time, the amygdala has already decided before you even begin to process the rational side of it. Now, when your inner desire, your emotional, your pull, is in conflict um, with your thinking or your outer projections, that's where you manifest dysfunction in your life. So, if you're full of hate and anger, and yet you walk around like this, and you want everyone to see how happy you are, and you want everyone to see how kind and sweet you are, and on the inside you're going, oh God, I hate her so much. This is where dysfunction begins to manifest in your life. It can manifest in, in stress, anxiety, worry. It can manifest, uh, you see it, autoimmune disorders uh, are by and large um, related to uh, stress. Heart disease is by and large related to stress. Um, more than anything else, stress is the biggest factor related to heart disease. Um, there's studies on this everywhere. And um, depression, again. And so you have this, this, this tension going on because um, you present yourself a certain way, you look a certain way, you say things a certain way, but you're not even aware of the emotional cog that's driving 
um, the, this inner desire that is in conflict with everything else you're projecting. And so how do you get to the root of that? Okay, second thing. So first thing is you, your walk may what match your talk, but does it match your heart? The second thing is what you desire in your heart is what you worship. Now you've got to do some real honest assessment here. What is it that your heart desires most? So in James chapter 1, verse 14 through 17, it says this, Each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire. Well, I don't know where that thought come from. It was just a fiery dart from Satan. I, I, don't want, I don't think about those things at all. I don't want that. I don't know where that thought came from. No, you got to own it. Dragged away by your own evil desire. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, what is full uh, grown, gives birth to death. Again, Romans 8, 6, the mindset on the flesh is death. Right? And so when we cultivate desire, when we have the desire within us that is in conflict with God, we're conflict with ourselves. Um, it's when we meditate on that that we're dragged away, we're enticed and dragged away. And when desire is conceived, it gives birth to death, death to sin. Then it goes on to say, don't be deceived, brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift, the really good things of life, the things worthy of desire, come from the Father of heaven and lights who does not change like shifting shadows. He's saying, be careful what you set your heart's affection and desires on. All right, so what you desire in your heart is what you worship. So you have to take an honest inventory of what it is that you desire. you got to get to the root. And so several years ago when I was going through my depression, um, because of some things that had happened to me as a child, um, I developed this belief system that um, I wasn't a priority. Now, I didn't know this at the time. And this is after I've done a lot of work, but, but I'm, I'm reversing it. And so through the freedom prayer, I'm asked, Lord, what is, it, what is it that you want me to know? And Jeff, I want you to know that you're a priority to me. I've always loved you. Um, you're a son to me. I want what's best for you. I was there. I've been there all along. Uh, you, you are my priority. And so what I realized was, because what I experienced um, made me feel like it wasn't important, make it was, wasn't a priority, maybe some abandonment of uh, type uh, feelings or emotions. Um, and so later in life, when something would take place, uh, oh, I didn't get the invitation, or um, you know what, um, my wife, you know, decided to make fish for dinner rather than steak, and I had asked for steak. Whatever, it could be anything, but when that happens, I would get angry. The emotion, Arr, angry. I didn't know why I was angry. The anger, unfulfilled um, anger, angry at everything. So and so uh, didn't fulfill the job request like I asked. Why didn't they? they well, or so and so left the church because um, they're going over to so and so's. You know, uh, angry. Every response is anger, anger, anger. And the anger leads to anxiety and depression. So I find myself full on depression. But as I, as I excavate and trace it back, it was this desire to be priority, um, to be put first. And so I had to do two things. One, I had to hear from God and God told me, Jeff, you're a priority to me. But then two, um, repent and confess where I've been trying to be God and be the priority. Um, he needs, he, he's telling me, Jeff, you're a priority, but Jeff, I need to be number one, uh, not you. And so as I got to the root and I was honest um, and came to realize that everything I have is good. God's blessed me um, and, and 
my marriage, my kids, uh, the church, uh, where, where I pastor, uh, these are gifts from God. And so I don't need to set my affections and my desires on other things just to be grateful for the blessings that God has given me. Um, and then where those two things are in conflict, begin to ask God to transform my desires because only desire can root out desire. You can't logic yourself into feeling passionate about something else. You can't logic yourself. Um, you have to cultivate right desires. Now we're going to talk about that next week. Um, but here's what I want you to do. You see, what you desire in your heart is what you worship. So ask yourself, is God truly, truly the number one object of your affection? Your number one desire, your number one priority. What, what would compete with God? Is it your children, your children's health, job performance, success? Um, what's, what, what competes with Jesus being the number one priority in your life? Now that's the easy part, right? Now you have to do the reverse engineering. Why? I knew a guy, he was one of the most successful preaching, teaching evangelist that I'd ever met. Young, good-looking, charismatic, could sell ice cubes to Eskimos. I mean, he he could get it done. And yet he grew up in a very dysfunctional, broken home in a trailer park where his dad left at a very young age. And even though he was incredibly successful as a minister, and even though he was incredibly, uh, you know, just really well thought of and doing great, it caught up with him and he was having a breakdown and going through counseling because at the end of the day what he he came to realize is his success was driven by this desire to show hey dad you left and abandoned me I'm important I'm significant I'm worth it and once he came to that, he was still charismatic. He was still a gifted speaker. He was still a great evangelist, but he was doing it from a different heart of motivation, truly as an act of worship, rather than a performance trying to prove his worth. These are the types of questions we need to ask us. What motivates me? What is my desire? What's at the root of why I've placed this other thing? desire above my desire to follow Jesus, to worship Jesus, to love Jesus, to pursue him, to pursue what he says is good, to be grateful for what he's given me. Could be a spouse. Uh, every couple I know that's going through um, dysfunction, there's one or both of the spouses desire something other than what God's given them. And this is hard. It's a hard lesson. Um, Every good and perfect gift comes from God. Right. Job. Could be a job. People are changing jobs like crazy because it's a, it's a job market. Um, what is it that God's leading you to? And, and why the change? Don't you think God wants me to be happy? Yeah, maybe he wants you to be happy right where you are. Um you know, so you have to really pursue what is it that, that God is leading and that God is desiring in your relationship and your work relationships. Um, at the end of the day, discerning from the Holy Spirit, and this is why we always start with the Spirit, what is it you want me to do? What is driving this decision? Is this decision being driven by success, uh, money, um, What's driving it? And so you got to get down to the desires of why you're doing what you're doing. Because here's the thing. God looks at the heart. And you can fake it. I mean, you can fake the rest of the world. You can look the part. You can speak the part. You can do everything on the outside the right way. But inside, if you're driven by an ulterior motive, a trigger that you may not even know why it's driving you, but it manifests in anxiety, worry, fear, hypervigilance, judgmental, um, perfectionism all of these things um, 
something else is driving the bus. And only you can come to honesty with God and say, Lord, I confess that. I've, I'm such a perfectionist because my fear is that I won't be good enough. Yet I am who you say. You know, all, all of these types of things are, are at play. And so as a man thinks in his heart, that's who he really is. So the question is, how's your heart? What is the object of your affection and your desires? The best way to do that is identify the emotion, anxiety, fear, worry, anger, guilt, shame, greed. Identify what it is that's driving your decision making. Approval, success. Um, what is it that's, that's driving that? And get to the root of it. And bring it before the Lord and say, Lord, I want you to be the object of my desire and my affection. And so one of the practices that's easy to do is, and I do this all the time, when I encounter scripture, I write, Jeff, I'm listening to the Holy Spirit. Jeff, I want you to know. And I just sit there with that prompt. What is it that you want me to know, Lord? Jeff, I want you to know. I want you to know that I'm a priority. I want you to know that every good and perfect gift comes from me. And that these desires that are not from me will entice you, but they lead to death. And so, Jeff, don't say one thing, but inside, in your heart, actually crave something else. Don't just white knuckle and do the right thing while in your heart really want something else feel something else work on this issue of the heart match your heart up with me Lord every good and perfect gift comes from you and so I accept this gift that you've given me I accept the gift of my spouse I accept the gift of my job I accept the gift of these circumstances I accept the gift of this lost relationship I accept it it's your will it's from you. It's a perfect gift. And so emotionally, I let go of all the other things. Because my heart's affection is for you. And then, I write down, I will. I will. So in this instance, I might would say, Jeff, uh, I want you to know. And then I would say back to God, God, I will make an honest inventory of my emotions and bring them before you. And so, you know, again, this is teeing up what we're going to talk about next week, but um, how's your heart? Hope this finds you well. If uh, I can help you out in any way, um, reach out to us on, uh, on this feed. God bless you. Take care.